Hey guys, welcome to our April program with Michael Jenkins. My name is Mark Itelli with Couple Firm, Florida Native Plant Society, uh, where our mission has always been the conservation, preservation, and restoration of native plants and native plant communities. So I'm gonna go through our announcements really quickly. Um, we have a lot to cover this time with events, plus our May board elections are coming up. So I'm gonna go through these slides and then introduce Michael to you all. Uh, I'm very excited to have Michael here. He's one of the kindest, uh, most well-mannered uh, men out there. And uh, he definitely sets the standard for uh, men in the plant and natural uh, professional industry. So I'm very excited to have him with us. So let's go through our slides really quickly. Um, uh, this video will be available on our YouTube channel. So it's youtube.com slash couple of firm. Can uh, subscribe right here. There are tons of videos and educational content. We recommend that you share and embed those win uh, videos if you are interested. A uh, couple of firm members, please report your volunteer hours uh, in case you do not know how to do that yet. Uh, you can always email coupleoffern at gmail.com and I'll be happy to send you the link. Uh, any type of volunteer hours counts, gardening, plant sale, volunteer work. Um, if you're doing a class like some of our directors are doing nowadays, plant rescues, etc. Any type of couple of front activity qualifies towards volunteer hours. Plus your drive time also qualifies as volunteer hours. So we can send you information about that. Uh, just email couple of at gmail.com. Um, our board elections are coming up. Uh, Barbara Whittier, our longtime and long-standing vice president of events, has uh, chosen to stay on uh, for another two years. Uh, so we're very excited to have her. Jen Bonaskiewicz is a new addition to our team. She is taking on secretary. And Al Squires, uh, who recently relocated from Mangrove Chapter further south, is going to be our chapter representative. We're very excited to have Al. Uh, he is a veteran of the Florida Native Plant Society group, so we are excited and honored to have him. Our director at large is Kaylee Adams, Gia Lee Ectel, and Jennifer Hopton Villalobos. Many of these names uh, will sound very familiar to you because they have agreed to stay on and renew their uh, director at large with us. And then speaking of additional director at large, this uh, year we have three additional ones, Jonathan Shipper, Kimberly Warner, and Steven Steinbaker. So I'm very happy to train them and uh, bring them into the Cup of Fern fold and uh, take Cup of Fern to the next level. Uh, our upcoming, out, upcoming outreaches our, are uh, pretty jam-packed. And when I mean jam-packed, I mean the plant sale. So uh, our previous plant sale was very well attended. Uh, our next one is at the same place and same time frame, uh, And it's gonna be this Saturday, April 17th. So please come out, uh, get your plants. Uh, Pre-sale orders are almost finalized. So in case you were a member that or requested plants, um, we finally got the uh, uh, plant order straightened out this afternoon. So they will be in your inbox based on what the nursery has in stock. And then we have an Earth Day broadcast in Espanol. So we are targeting our Latinx community, uh, helping them understand the beauty and importance of native plants and natural ecosystems. And this is timed on Earth Day, which is April 22nd at 4 p.m. So more information is to follow and it will be a live stream on Facebook and our YouTube channel. So stay tuned with that. Our May program is on the 10th, which is always the second Monday of each month. And this time around, it'll be on Florida Mosses with Brandon Corder. Uh, just a wonderful young gentleman uh, who is uh, obtaining his PhD from the University of Wisconsin at Madison. Uh, but he's a longtime resident of Central Florida and um, Florida Mosses is something that we'll be excited to learn from him about. And then our final plant sale of the season is May 15th. So it'll be next month. Uh, and this will be at Royal Park at Lake Helen. 
and that's going to be from 11 a.m. until 4.30 p.m. So if you are a member, you will receive the plan request form again. So uh, stay tuned for that. Uh, it should be in your inbox probably within a week or so. And then don't forget, we're having our special class with Nita Villalobos Bell, and she'll be talking about identifying oak species in Central Florida. And that will be Saturday, May 22nd at 11 a.m. And this is a ticketed event. It'll be through Zoom. Uh, we'll send you more information about that closer to time. I'll also put it into the chat box uh, while Michael is presenting so you can uh, check it out, uh, refer somebody else who might be interested. It's going to be a very cool class. Uh, I think Nita is covering about 18 different oak species just here in Central Florida. So if this is something that is uh, of interest to you, if you'd like to kind of sharpen your ID skills, uh, definitely uh, purchase a ticket. It supports Couple of Fern, a nonprofit chapter of the Florida Native Plant Society. And then come grow with us, as I always say. We have events, plant sale events. They're uh, they're alive and well with Couple of Fern. We're doing three plant sales in spring uh, this year. So we're on our second plant sale come April 17th. And then we'll have workshops like the identification of oak trees in Central Florida. We're doing community gardening uh, on April 17th. We're actually doing a garden refresh at Seminole IFAS. Uh, we'll be starting field trips very soon, probably by the end of summer as we come out of COVID and people are getting vaccinated and things are uh, slowly but surely reopening. And then we're huge on virtual learning. So you probably know that already. Uh, we were one of the fewest uh, organizations that embraced the online platform, uh, I think maybe two weeks after the nationwide shutdown. So uh, I think that news came about uh, mid-March last year, and our very first virtual learning experience was April 1st. So we responded very quickly. Uh, internships are also available. Uh, four interns are uh, graduating out of their internship program this semester, and we're already anticipating a few more for next semester. We have environmental study areas and, of course, plant sales. And uh, Members are basically in the central and north Orlando metropolitan area, or you are distant learners. So let me pull up the map here real quick. This is the bulk of our membership. It shows you just the north Orlando suburb area, Maitland, Winter Park, Altamont, all the way up into West Volusia, which we also serve. And then if you are a distant learner, a distance learner, uh, then you're even further away. And that's fine because we are pretty strong in our online outreach. So please join uh, fnps.org, click on the join button and then select couple of firm from the dropdown. We have student, individual, household, business level memberships. This is what the form looks like. If you scroll down, you can select couple of firm and that is fnps.org slash join. All right, and tonight, without further ado, uh, very excited to have this gentleman, Rare Central Florida Plants and Conservation in the Field with Michael Jenkins. Michael, I'm gonna stop my screen share here. Um, and if you could introduce yourself, we can take it over with your presentation. Glenn, thank you, thank you. It's really nice to be here. We're uh, <clears throat> had all this, uh, rain happening here we got looked like we got stuck between two high pressure uh, ridges there and had the the typical april giant storms there i i, I take it y'all are still getting those rains um yeah we can okay good and and we can uh ask questions and maybe have discussions at the end of the presentation i believe um y'all would like to but again my name is Mike Jenkins uh, work with the Florida Forest Service um, we administer uh, federal grants for uh, conservation of federally listed plants um, and some other things too um, but uh, I've, I do a lot of work with uh, uh, with these rare plants and, and a lot with the grant itself and a lot with um, uh, contractors and and 
the projects themselves, but um, I've worked with the uh, Florida Park Service uh, statewide, basically with private consultants, um, Bureau of Invasive Plant Management, um, and uh, now the Florida Forest Service, and, and, I, and I've worked with FNA also, the Florida Natural Areas Inventory. So I had a pretty good, uh, that last job, I remember seeing the couplet fern. I was mapping some exotics out for uh, Seminole County, and I uh, came across a work site where they had contractors spraying around the couplet fern. They, they weren't close to it, but I think it was air potato, if, if I remember right. Um, but uh, I do remember that. Uh, and I did get to see the plant too. It's a, it's an amazing, amazing fern, but I'll talk more on that here in a little bit. We'll go right on with the presentation. I've quite a few slides. I'd like to kind of go through them kind of quick. Uh, so, uh, so let's go ahead and start it up on the slide too. Like I said, this, this position here, every state gets money from the Endangered Species Act uh, to conserve rare plants and animals. So FWC gets the funding for uh, animals in the Florida Forest Service or FDAX. You know, FDAX is the main mother organization to the Florida Forest Service. So it's actually FDAX that gets the money for it. We get about $250,000 a year. Uh, started in 1991. Uh, so we're, we're getting close to our 30 year anniversary here. So uh, I've been here about 10 years doing this. Uh, here, these are two species that we work with quite a bit, two federally listed plants. These are scrub plants. Um, this pygmy fringe tree, we, that is actually the more common species is right here. Is, blooming pretty good right now in Tallahassee, although it's a little bit past its peak and the waria blooms in the fall. But um, so the goal that we have, uh, it's to restore and maintain existing populations of listed plants, kind of like FNPS uh, mission statement there. So we do that through two Florida Forest Service positions. The one that I do is more administrative, but we also have, this is kind of exciting for a lot of people because this position is actually going to be opening up within the next few months. The current pop, it's at Lake Wales Ridge State Forest. There's a scrub plant ecologist position there and the ecologist is leaving, uh, wanted to move up to Jacksonville and uh, is leaving. She was a great uh, staff there, did, did awesome things. Um, I'll talk more about that here in a second. But we also administer grant money to Florida Native Plant Society, uh, universities, colleges, things like that. Um, and I'll get more into that too. So the tasks that, that we do is I administer a lot of forms. I do get outside and I, and I do a lot of what I'm going to – talk about this a lot in this presentation. To me, it's my main focus is uh, um, plants that are fire adapted sometimes don't get burned enough and they they get shaded out. So we do a lot of uh, reduction of, of oaks and tie tie and things like that. Um, it's become a main focus. So when I get some free time away from the desk, I go out and open up pitcher plant bogs and scrub and sand hill and stuff like that. Also do plant rescue. We do GIS mapping. We can map things out. Uh, we work, submit FNA ele element occurrence data. That's the natural heritage program. That's a very important program. It's, it's in North America. So it's a big database. Nature serve uh, has that database and we, the Florida, Natural Areas Inventory is out of FSU. We work with them a lot. We have a database of all the reports that we've ever done. We uh, fund a lot of projects. Uh, so we keep a database for that. And I'll talk more about that in a second. Do a lot of invasive plant removal. Uh, we help biologists with five-year reviews. We, You know what we do a lot of? We've kind of gotten into... Uh, 
people from out of state do a lot of research here and we'll go out and, and get their DNA samples for them if they need it, soil samples, stuff like that. Uh, we help with research authorizations on the state forests, uh, do some presentations, um, get a lot of phone calls and emails from our website. We, there is a land acquisition grant that we work with. We're actually, uh, we actually just submitted a proposal to acquire land in Lake Kerr by No Cala National Forest. Um, I maintain a list of rare plants because there's so many different names that people use and so many different organizations. We have a, a spreadsheet for that. It's a list of that. We also tally state of Florida expenditures on federally listed plants. So we uh, regularly talk to the people who are active in federally listed plant conservation and tally their expenditures and attend meetings for the Endangered Plant Advisory Council. They're the ones who decide which plants are endangered and threatened and the Rare Plant Task Force, which is uh, a really good plant conservation community um, uh, meeting that they have every year. So another task I have is I talk with the Lake Wales Ridge biologists a lot and we, but they, the Lake Wales Ridge biologists, they have 16 species of federally listed plants and one lichen there. I'm not sure if it's the most in one conservation land in the country. We still have to find that out, but that's a lot. So uh, Hannah Rosner Katz is her name. She, she works with 16 different uh, federally listed plants. And that position is opening up soon. Um, but they uh, help with the fire management. They determine population trends. They look at a lot of management and how, how it's doing with the plants and document new plant uh, locations. These are the species that they work with. Um, 16, these are all scrub species. So, um, but these are the levels and I'll talk about these monitoring levels later. Um, but that's just, that's a lot of, a lot of different projects for a lot of different species. So, and that's Lake Wales Ridge State Forest. You know, that's a great place to visit if you guys do like rare plants uh, because Bach Tower and Archbold are all pretty close to Lake Wales Ridge State Forest. So you can do a really, really nice day trip down there and get to see lots of stuff. But I'd take a couple of days because Lake Wales Ridge State Forest is huge and you can botanize all over. They did a good job burning out there. Invasives, they do a good job. At, you should check it out if you can. So we have Florida in comparison to other states, we have a lot of federally listed plants compared to other states. 54 endangered, 14 threatened. And then we have 29 species that are being petitioned for federally listed. And those are actually, those species are um, game for being funded by this program. And we have one marine grass, um, the Johnson's seagrass. So we've funded over 110 prod, uh, projects by over 39 different organizations. And it's helped over 100 federal, state, and non-listed rare plant taxa. Uh, um, so 46 species of those were federally endangered too. Um, we keep good track of the uh, projects and where they were and everything. These are the current projects we have. Uh, and almost every one of these uh, involves Florida Native Plant Society volunteers. Um, this is... Uh, so we have two staff positions. We have the Archbold Biological Station, Florida Zizophis Project, which I, I think is one of the best conservation success, success stories that there is. It's a very long-term project, and the plant was thought to be extinct at one point, <laughs> and they just recently refound it. And they, they had some problems with it, with the Florida Zizophis Um it was found out to be genetic, but it took a lot of a lot of time to figure it out. But they figured it out. Now they're producing hundreds and even thousands, and they're uh, outplanting them. And so it's been a real success story. But so we also have 
Um, Bach Tower Garden uh, is doing a lot of restoration. Uh, Florida Native Plant Society, that's Flor That's the Terea project that we have. That's been very successful. Um, two native Florida Native Plant Society projects, uh, one with a couple of di Dicerander species down here in the peninsula. But the Terea one is very exciting and uh, successful to, to uh, follow. So there's also Jacksonville Zoo and Gardens are very uh, active in plant conservation. They're, they have a project. We have an individual uh, up here. He's in tall timbers, but uh, he's uh, looking for, he's working with Bach to uh, look for Schwabia around the state. Uh, Florida Natural Areas of Interior, FNA, they do a lot of surveying for us and they're doing, they're surveying these at risk species. Um, and then we have Lee County's doing some, some land management. They have two projects and they are, uh, helping out a federally listed plant there, the uh, or, uh, Duringothamus polchellus over there. Um, so all of the, pr all of the pro projects that we fund have their information into this database and you can search it by county or by uh, managed area. You know, um, you could do it by, the organization or by the person's name. Um, but all of that information is open to people, mostly to researchers. Um, so that's on our website. Um, so we have um, another interesting thing we do that I try to remind people who do work with federally listed plants that we keep a pretty good tally of state organizations who do the work with that. And if you're ever interested in working with an endangered uh, plant, I can give you years and years of data of which state organizations did work with that plant. Um, so now I also wanted to talk about conservation program. This is not federal money here. This is in a different division of FDACs. I do try to remind people about this because it can't, it's very confusing because the names are very similar. Uh, see, we're in the Florida Forest Service, but in the Division of Plant Industry, in the Bureau of Entom Entomology, Nematology, and Plant Pathology, they're the ones who administer the Rule 5B40, which is the uh, preservation of the native flora of Florida, and they're in Gainesville, and uh, so FMPS is, is on the Endangered Plant Advisory Council, the EPAC uh, meetings that they have, where they decide... Uh, um, endangered and threatened species. They also do the permits to harvest if you're going to be doing research or collecting plant uh, tissue. Um, they do the rare plant species regulation. Um, and they have grants uh, for uh, Bach Tower, um, Archbold, Fairchild Tropical Botanical Garden, and Key West Botanical Garden. And uh, so, so it's a different but you can go pretty good together. So if you're interested in that kind of stuff, I can point you to the right people. But this is the good contact is Dr. Patty Anderson. So um, for this talk, I was going to look at rare plant conservation, uh, rare plant advocacy. Um, to me, Florida Native Plant Society is the best in the state that we have doing that. So, um, but plant propagation and outplantings, which Native Plant Society also does a lot of good work with. Uh, and then the mapping management and monitoring and research of, of in-situ, uh, in place. The, the in-situ uh, means in place. That means a native population. The, the ex-situ population is, uh, I guess this, yeah, right here. That That's where you take the plants and then you grow them out um, and that's called ex situ. And then you can put them back into, uh, have an introduction of plants into places where you think they grew or augment populations, you know, and then the in situ, we'll talk about that. And then the last part is what I've learned in this position, which is always a good thing. So first rare plant advocacy, you guys do all the, 
the the really great work here in the state. But um, I would like to bring up the things that I would really love to see maybe an increase in. Uh, it's engaging with the public at large and our politicians, our decision makers, but also the land managers that we have. Um, so engaging with that, that's the public at large. You know, you have your festivals, they plant nurseries, your plant sales that you guys are having. These are great ways to advocate nat native plants, obviously. Um, but land management reviews are good when you're looking more towards in situ populations and you're helping land managers of different conservation lands manage, uh, um, you know, rare plants as best as they can. Um, here's the thing I wanted to point out that a lot of time on these, these public lands are um, multi-use and a lot of times the, conservationists leave without a trace and they and there's a lot of good advocacy that comes from native plant society and, and from you know plant enthusiasts you know but it would, if you ever want to help it out a little bit more if you if you if you're driving by and you see a nature center or some of their offices just stop by and talk to them about it because the more we the more that those land managers see that there's an interest for rare plants, the, the, that the better it is. And I'm just saying that's because a lot of times we just, we aren't, uh, you know, in there talking with them and stuff. So, and a lot of the other people are the horse people and the ORV people there. They do a lot of talking with the land managers. So the more we can do even just individually, it, the better. So, um, and I would also, I'd also like to remind folks that when you're out looking at rare plants to get some data and submit it to the Florida Natural Areas Inventory. Um, and um, so, so they can, you know, uh, document the, those. Um, and then the other kind of plant advocacy, uh, assisting in projects, that helps scientific understanding. Here's, here's some things that we've been working on lately. These are kind of identification cards. Now this, these cards are nice because we have foresters and rangers who they're not botanists, but these, these kind of cars right here can basically make it, you know, unquestionable if they can identify the plant species because they're always looking for these species, but it's just kind of hard for them to know how to do it. But uh, so you basically take the dichotomous uh, couplets out of plant keys. This one comes out of the Wonderland and Hanson Guide to Vascular Plants. And you take those couplets and you put them into the, the pictures. And you, you kind of have to look at the couplets first and then take the pictures. But uh, these are not for profit. They're just for use. They're free uh, for everyone. And uh, so, you know, it's good. Like here's another Conradina species that we have. So they're good to kind of compare if you, um, if you have them in the same place. These, these Conradina species don't really grow together. Uh, but when you want to compare them, they're nice to have. Here's another one. These, are, these ID cards are really good when it comes to identifying, difficult to identify species like the sedges and rushes. Um, and here, you know, you can save a lot of time for somebody when you have a good ID card like this. Um, it, it, it just makes people more effective and, and you, you get more bang for the buck, uh, going out and not having to spend a lot of time learning. There's no, there's less of a learning curve there, but these are great cards. And if you, and we share them with everyone, if you ever wanted to make some, we could, We'd love to have them if you make them. There's a lot of room for artistic license there. And, um, but uh, but you can see how these are ID cards work really, how, how good they can be for, uh, you know, helping to identify species in the field. So the next part, plant propagation. I don't have much on this. Now, we in, in our program, we, we do fund a lot of plant propagation. 
like I said, uh, through Bach, Fairchild, um, and uh, the universities do a lot of it. UF is doing some a lot of it right now. Um, so I don't have too much on this, but it is something that we fund a lot of. Um, I myself, I don't have any kind of facilities to really do it. Lake Wells Ridge is mostly out in the field, but um, but we would really invite people to think about uh, plant increasing plant propagation for rare plants and and maybe introducing them or reintroducing them to places. Um, and I, I was noticing with the couplet fern, I asked, and I'm sure y'all know this much better than I do, um, but I, I just asked around and I talk, was talking with Jennifer po Posley over at Fair, Fairchild Tropical Botanical Garden, and she said she had still has um, plants from that were cultivated from the 80s from Richard Mo Moiraud, who's he's actually the Native Plant Society representative at, at EPAC, at the Endangered Plant Advisory Council. Uh, he's in South Florida. Um, but she said they have two plants at, at Fairchild, uh, one in the fern glade, uh, and then the other one, I guess, is just in the nursery. But I thought that was kind of interesting. And um, but we do fund that kind of work. If you're ever looking for funding for for plant propagation, out plantings, and things like that, we do. If it's if it's with a federally listed plant, uh, we can fund that. Okay, we're going to go to mapping of in situ uh, rare plants. Now, so looking at at the couplet fern uh, area here, the Seminole County. Um, it's, it's a lot of really nice land has been preserved. I was just talking with Mark and he's saying that, that Ocal or that Orlando is moving out into the County there. Um, and, uh, but it looks like you've done a really good job of, of protecting some land there in the County. Um, and that's, that's, that's awesome. That's really where we do a lot. Most of our projects is on, it's either, it's either on public uh, conservation lands or conservation easements or nature conservancy type lands, you know, conservation lands. So um, a great place to get that, those conservation lands is FNA again, FNA and they maintain the, a database of all the conservation lands in the state. So, so um, this one's from 2019, Matt. But I can see you guys are you guys have quite the wonderful uh, a bunch of conservation lands in your area. Looks like you have a pretty pretty good county and water management, state parks. That Wakaira Springs and Rock Springs run are some of my favorite places in the world. Little Brig Econ State Forest. That so. Um, but when we're mapping species, this is usually where we're doing it, is on the conservation lands, usually not on private lands. Um, but when we're also mapping, we're wanting to figure out what species are there. We, we look at uh, physiographic regions. Uh, you can see the Central Lake District. Um, you know, that's a, uh, a bunch of up uplifted limestones and... Um, with the Florida aquifer right below them, um, the Eastern flatwoods in this part in the, over here, uh, the, the coastal lowlands, there were barrier islands and lagoons, uh, you know, in the, in the Pleo Pleistocene, you know, 5 million years ago to now, or to, or to, but I like, these are the ones I like to look at are the, the sub-districts, um, you can see these, um, and I like to look at these regions and, and, and it would be great to conserve plants based on these, these um, physiographic regions. Like if you could describe where all the plants are, every species really, common and uncommon in these, I think that's where we kind of need to go um, with it because 
what happens is you have populations that may be very important. They can get winked out in a it, it, pretty easily. Really important populations or, or populations that are um, on the periphery or outliers. And if you take if you if you take these physiographic regions, which are kind of smaller, sometimes even only as big as a ridge or something, and really focus um, conservation efforts in in those regions. Um, so the Castleberry Oviedo, Oviedo Geneva um, ones. I, I, Uh, thick residual sands with terrace flatwoods and river swamps. So they kind of each have their own entity, you know, their own, uh, you know, identity. Um, this Halapan Indian town ridges and swales down in here. I know you just got a little bit of it in here, um, but it, 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 I guess it used to be a barrier spit in the ocean of, and it has shell and settlement sediments. That's very, very interesting to look at the, the physiographic uh, region. And um, it, what's exciting is these will be updated soon. Uh, it, so pretty soon within the next year, we'll have, we'll have kind of an updated set of these. And I, I think it would be good to use those as a foundation for conserving the rare plants and animals. They're perfect size for it. Um, not too big, not too small, but um, I'll I'll keep going because I, I think I'm I need to catch up here. Now here is lidar data. You know this is shaded relief, but it, it comes from from lidar data. So you this plant, you know you 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 can go right to these scrub areas. Uh, you know this is your highest scrub areas. You can tell these are barrier islands of the past. You know these. Uh, coming from longshore drift and these lagoons and you can see this old river channel of the St. John's. I love these kinds of maps. These are, these are the shaded relief maps are some of my favorite ones to, to look at. Um, you can see creeks and, but uh, that's the shaded relief and that comes from the LIDAR data. Um, so um, the, here in Seminole County, you have about 105 species that um, are either state listed or at, tracked by FNA. And um, we have a GIS kind of a program that we use for these. Um, they have this, there, there's other uh, search engines you can use for counties, uh, but we go a little bit, little bit further than, than, than the other ones for what, what we use to decide which plants are in which county. But uh, so in Seminole, we look, at, we look at 105 species of rare plants. These would either be federal, state, listed, endangered, or threatened, or tracked by FNA. FNA tracks plants that, that are not listed. They, they can track plants. They don't, it doesn't take them a long time to decide whether to track plants or not, so. Um, so that's why there's a disparity. So 21 species in Seminole County are endemic to Florida. You know, they're just, they just grow in Florida and the whole world. Uh, so you have four endangered federally listed species. Uh, you have 99 endangered by the state of Florida. Um, two species are threatened, federal threatened, and 38 species are threatened by the state of Florida. So here's what we're talking about with FNA, the Florida Natural Areas Inventory. They're the Natural Heritage Program, but so 65 of the 105 species they're tracked, but they also track 10 species um, that are not even listed in the in the county. So there's a lot of rare plants here to look for. What I like about rare plants is that when you document them and when you have them, then you can take that habitat where they. Are. And if you, if you do that, there's going to be a lot of rare plants and animals that are, that come along with them. Um, they're going to be in the same habitat. And if you manage that habitat for these species, you're, you're going to get a lot of plant, rare plants and animals that benefit from that too. Um, 
so we'll go mapping them. You, 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 you want to learn how to really identify them too. And so this species right here, I'm really bringing light to this species because it's one being petitioned for federal protection. And we'd love to know as much as we can on it because it's kind of an under documented species. I think there's probably going to be a lot more of it than, than, than we know about so far. Um, but it's Florida loose strife and, uh, it, it's a rare species, but, um, it, it, it's a, it's like that loose strife that grows up North, but this is a native native one, not a, not a pesky invasive plant. Um, but we would love to know about it. If anyone knows about this plant in the County, I would love to know about it or even anywhere else because we're mapping it to decide whether it should be federal or not. Uh, you can see it doesn't, it's not in Seminole County, but it's pretty close and its main populations are down here. However, recent surveys, we keep finding it around. So we'd love it if you guys would tell us about that. So here in this, when it comes to plant conservation, I've noticed in Florida, these things, these seepage slopes, wet prairies, uh, savannas, some people call them pitcher plant bogs. Um, you know, these, these are really special habitats and, and most of them you can find, you can use these species such as this uh, snake mouth orchid and, and, and know when, know when you have a, a high quality uh, seepage slope or a uh, wet prairie kind of habitat with them. Uh, they stand out there. They'll be all blooming right now, uh, but they, but they stand out and the, they really just mark really high quality um, habitat, the, the seepage slope habitat or the wet prairie habitat. I tried to bring light to these species right here because most of them are all covered up and uh, they've been, they just don't get burned. I'm, and sometimes these seepage areas don't get burned, but they're very, imp very important. So, um, you know, the, you have your calipogon orchids uh, that are in these habitats also. Um, and, uh, of course, this one's a great one, the the calipogon multiflorus that blooms just 20, you know, just a couple weeks after fire. And you can chase them, chase fires around and look for them. A lot of people do that. Um, but these are kind of the similar species, uh, you can look at, uh, how to identify them and stuff like that. These have really, really kind of wider distinctive. These are the sepals. The ones that the three bottom ones are sepals. These are the, the petals. And this is, uh, I can show you a picture. That's the way you look at Calipogon orchids. Uh, and they, I guess they're, flowers upside down that usually it's it's turned the other way with flowers the the, the labellum's at the bottom of the flower but uh the the calipogon here uh it seems to be flipped compared to other pl uh flowers but um so um yeah you know uh this is the rare species the california the multi-flower um grass pink. I think people call them beautiful beards. I've heard people call them. Um, but yeah, you know, these things will mark really good habitat. So this is what we're looking for in these seepage areas. That's an interesting noise. I think I'm getting more. Hold on one second. Oh, that's one of this. All right. All right. Um, if we can m map these species, and then manage for those species. They're going to have a lot of other rare species near them. Here's some here's some more that you guys have down here. It's a pinguicula. This is another carnivorous plant where the the bugs uh, walk in here, and it's real it's real greasy. And I think they slip and slide, and they get stuck, and then they get ingested by the by the leaves. But um, if you find these in a habitat in a seepage habitat that's a good place to, to really map really well. Um, send it to FNA and, and see it, see if you can go in and, 
and make sure that it's getting burned or uh, it's getting maintained in an open in an open way because there's not many places like this left in the peninsula and we really got to uh, protect those areas here. These are some more, these bog torches. Now these are getting more and more rare all the time. So if you, if you do know of populations of these, just really, if you can advocate or work yourself to, uh, you know, volunteer yourself or, or to do whatever you can to keep these habitats open and keep these species uh, going. You guys have a lot of these bog torch species around. Um, so, and, and if, if you can't get fire in there, you can manage these populations without fire. You can, you can, uh, just maintain them just with hand tools, really a lot of these places. But, uh, um, so here's a real kind of noteworthy plant that a lot of people know the um, Catesby's lily. This is another seepage slope species. Um, you know, a lot of these places that you find them only in right of ways because they're mowed. And the reason for that is the surrounding areas just are not getting mowed or burned enough and they're just getting shaded out. So the only place you see them are in these right of ways that get mowed frequently. Um, but if you do find them, especially in the peninsula, it's really, really good just to make sure that those areas are getting conserved and um, managed well. So you guys have a special plant here, this Okeechobee gourd. And uh, I don't know that much about it. Our program has not done that many pro projects with this species, um, but we would like to. And I know during the annual state tally, I know that the water management district does drone surveys for these because they're out in the swamps and they, uh, they used to do helicopter surveys, but now they're, now they do drone surveys and um, are finding that the populations are doing pretty good. And I also know that the species is really easy to propagate too. And um, well, I don't know about easy. I'm, I'm not going to get, not going to go there, but um, I know that people who know how to propagate, are pretty successful with this species. So um, you guys are lucky to have that one. That's one I want to see. Cause I, I hear that they like that the gators help them out a little bit um, that they like to be around in ga gator waller wallows and stuff like that. But fantastic plants, native uh, gourd species here. Um, I always try to remind folks about conserving these uh, the wild pines and their bromeliads and things like that. We they can kind of get forgotten sometimes. I think, um, but these are just some of the rare plants in, in Seminole County. But um, good to document. Good to make sure the invasive plants or invasive animals are not tearing them up. There's a weevil out there that I know tears up these bromeliads. Uh, so you know conserving them is a high priority. This is an extremely rare plant. I know uh, it's not in the area, but this, I, I put this one in here because it would be a good one to propagate and to maybe introduce it to uh, places that are well burned, maybe in Seminole County, Carter's Waria. Um, they're great plants. They're great pollinator plants. Um, but now here's another species you know look at um, when you're mapping it. They can be, these. This is the giant orchid, and it can be it can grow in pastures or most of the times you find it in a really nice sand hill, well burned sand hill. Uh, but they can even grow in pastures. Um, uh, but this is a great species, and a lot of these, like I said, are are really just good. Um, indicators of high quality habitats. So when you have these species, just just really try to manage for them. And, and then you get all these other different species that come. So we're getting kind of higher up now. We started off in the wetter kind of habitats and now we're going up into the sand hills and scrub. Um, and some of these plants I, I'd like to, to present here 
as just being great indicator species. It, a lot of times you can find these in scrubs that haven't been burned, but along on the roadsides or in open disturbed areas. Um, and, and they're great to uh, document and to uh, share with, with FNA and the Natural Heritage Program. So um, this is a, the Florida Bonamia. Um, this is the typical way you see it in a lot of scrubs and sand hills. It's usually on the roadside with no flowers. You know, it does like to be burned and, um, and it grows really, really, it can, it can be locally abundant, you know. We have a lot of it at the Waria Tract in Lake County. It's part of Seminole State Forest. It's a hot spot for it. It's a stronghold for it. Uh, and, and at Lake Wales Ridge State Forest. Um, but this is another really good one that, that a lot of people find. It's a rare plant that's, it's not easy to find, but it's, it's one of the ones you will encounter more. And, and that, and it shows you that you're, you got nice sand hill around you and it may not be getting burned, but, um, it could be. So it's a great indicator species of, uh, sand hills. It's a smaller morning glory. Um, and these are your, uh, you know, your centrosemas and, and your fibaceous rare plant species. And when you're mapping, it's really, really good to kind of figure out how to identify these before you go out so you don't have to spend so much time keying plants out. Like with this, um, this rare plant, um, sand butterfly pea, pea, you can look at the, uh, the calyx and look how long it is compared to the other Centrosina. And, um, I don't know. It, it, it's just good to, uh, when, before you go out to, to know what you're looking for and be ready for it. That's where those ID cards come in really good. But, um, so when you compare it, Centrosema, Centrosema to uh, Clitoria, the Corolla tubes, you know, smaller. Um, now this is the one we have at Wary Track Two and at Lake Wales Ridge State Forest. This would be one you would find on scrubby, scrubby areas. Um, so there's just lots of, uh, you know, ways to to tell them, but um, it's good to. Um, you know, kind of familiarize yourself with the plants before you go out. Um, this is another one that you could have in, in Seminole County. The, uh, um, we, we have, we have a lot of predation by, uh, um, by bugs, uh, that get into the fruits and, um, but this would be a good one to do propagation with. I know Bach tower works with this plant a lot. And, um, but these are just some of the plants that you would find here in Seminole County. We, and we have grasses, you know, have rare, rare grasses, longleaf crab grass. It's a, it's a digitaria. So you don't have to be, stay focused on all the real uh, flowering species. It, again, you know, you find this out in the habitat and you're looking at good quality habitat. This one here. The Curtis's milkweed is a lot of people's favorite, and it uh, it's it's a great sandhill and scrub species. It was documented recently with uh, as being a species that likes to have nurse plants. It, when it's germinating, it likes to be uh, near have have a larger shrub or tree to grow in the shade of it, kind of like um, out west in the deserts. There are plants that, that like to have nurse trees. Like there's some cactus um, that'll grow underneath Palo Verdes and um, they'll use it as a, uh, as a nurse tree. And just in their germinating stages, they seem to like a little bit more shade, but it's a phenomenon called having a nurse tree and they documented it with that Curtis's milkweed. Um, but um, that's a great species. 
this is another one that you can find pretty easily when you're out there and uh, you can map it. Um, it. You can map good sandhill habitat with it. Even in ones that haven't burned in a long time, they'll be on the roadsides or in just kind of open areas. That's the Florida spiny pod. It's another one of these, uh, you know, these Madaleas and, um, but, uh, so now we're going to go into management and, um, so fire, I think a lot of people are aware that fire is good anytime. Sometimes you have to burn. If you haven't burned a place for a while and you need to knock the fuels down and stuff, but let's just remember, and for maybe for folks new to Florida here, who are listening, um, a lot of the lightning that we get comes in April and May. And the reason they start fires is because it, a lot of the habitat's very dry in April and May. So when, when these storms come and the, and the lightnings come, these summer thunderstorms, you know, the, the wet season, they call it, or the growing season, some people call it, or the lightning season, people call it. When they first, when the lightning first comes out, it's hitting really dry areas. And um, so if you look at tree ring data, this is where all this information comes from. Tree ring data, you can look at trees that are a couple of hundred years old and see that um, the burns were in April and May. And then there's another peak in June and July. And um, that's through some pretty serious dendrochronology and they're, they're the study of the tree rings and the tree rings, they're, they're different for each area. Um, they do a lot of this kind of research at tall timbers research station up here in Tallahassee. And uh, they like those physiographic regions that we were looking at earlier. There's fire uh, kind of regions too. It's very, very interesting, but that's how they determine how frequent fires are. So you, you look at longleaf pines that are hundred years old in the sand hills, you can see they've been burned every two or three or four years. Uh, and a lot of time when in April and May or June and July. But I tell you, a lot of these places in the past used to burn during droughts. And we don't really burn during droughts here. So sometimes it takes a lot more fire to knock out the oaks because we're not burning in drought conditions. But um, so we have to make up for it by doing fuel reduction. Uh, you know, hand, using the hand tools to kind of open up habitat right in the general area of the rare plants because uh, we're not burning during drought. So the oaks don't get killed quite as, as good. That we have to do this. Now, what, one of the reasons that we have to do this is because, um, because we don't burn during droughts, but also because um, when it comes to this kind of conservation, um, it's, it comes from taxpayer monies. So it, you know, on one side you would have a part of the population who would not fund this kind of work. And on the other hand, you have, um, somebody who would totally fully fund this work and in government, it falls in between there. So there's a compromise to the kind of work that can be done here. And whatever, so there's going to be some work that doesn't get done. And that's the kind of work that, that we need to kind of come in and augment what our management's already going on there. Um, so, so yeah, um, burning is good, but best when we mimic the, the natural lightning uh, season. So, um, the mowing is can be good. Um, there's lots to um, hearing and distant can be can be beneficial, but some species they can't handle it at all. Um, it's really important to look at local species and local um, 
conditions when when you're doing this kind of management. Um, so sometimes when you're restoring areas, you can have invasive grasses that come in. Now, what we found, if you don't want a lot of those invasive grasses to come in from adjacent areas, we've learned to keep those keep the um, the boundary areas unmowed and let them come up in sand live oak that shades them out and they're not a fire problem. The sand live oak's a really nice plant to have on the um, on the property boundaries because they're not real fire hazardous and, they, and they'll shade out um, invasive grasses that are coming into your, we found that at, at uh, the wary tract. But, um, but the best thing is, I've, a lot of people have told me this is to, is to, whenever you're doing restoration is to do a small area first and, and try to figure out the best way to do it. Um, small scale pilot kind of restoration projects before going to a bigger one. And, you know, a lot of times we will, we, we'll, kill oaks in different ways, but you just have to remember, you have to come back in and, and treat the re-sprouts and what comes up from the acorns that are, that are lying around. Um, you can actually make a, an area worse by getting rid of the oaks and not coming back in and following up, uh, getting rid of those oaks. I've seen that happen a, a lot. So, um, when you are restoring an area and you're getting rid of the oaks, just make sure that you're committed to going back year after year for several years and getting the re-sprouts and the, and the seedlings and saplings. Annual mowing it can be very, very beneficial. In fact, it's the only reason a lot of plants exist on the roadsides. The mowing is the only reason that they're there. Stopping the mowing will root will cause it to be shaded out and um so along your fire breaks and stuff having really wide mode areas can help you because um it creates less fuels that are right on the edges of the burn unit so it's less dangerous and when you remove those fuels when you mow it and remove those fuels it's also good for the rare plants there and the rare animals the gopher tortoises like it too so the mowing's mowing can be very good. You know, the timing of mowing is is very critical too. Um, some places may need to be mowed three or four times a year to keep it open. Some some can only do it once a year, like in scrub habitats. But um, mowing is very beneficial to fire adapted species. To the to the plants that are used to having fire come over them, the mowing mimics that in a way. So. Whenever we're working with rare plants, you want to get really thorough plant surveys. Um, the, a good place to start is to ask FNA for their FLEO database, their element occurrence data, and then also submit your data to them. You, a lot of times you can get it for free. Um, they'll tell you what rare plants and animals are in an area if you're looking to restore it or whatever you're going to do. Um, you'll want to th think about uh, doing fuel buster or fuel reduction in those fire adapted habitats around those species. Um, you can just do it with a single person. And I'm telling you what you, you know, what you can do, you can go in and put in two or three hours of just simple work around a rare plant population and they will, increase their population a lot. They'll increase their flowering. It'll increase germination in the seed bank. And um, it's a great, great thing to do. It, it's one of the most effective plant conservation uh, activities that we have. It's just going in basically and just removing the oaks and opening up the habitat to give more sunlight to the rare plants there. Um, so, We'll move on. Here, here's a good example. Like at the Waria track, you see these oaks around here. We we found one of of a a, a single Britain's bear grass clump. And when we opened up this habitat, we cut all these oaks out of here, 
it increased the population. You know, there's 50 or 60 plants out there now, and a lot of them are blooming, and it's just going to get bigger and bigger. But that's one thing, the greatest benefit that you have with this re removing the fuels. Um, so here's another great species that you guys have around a uh, couple of fern areas, the Garbaria, an endemic plant. It's the only one in its genus. You got to love these species that are, that are monotypic, that there's nothing else in the, in the genus. It's, it's in the Aster family, but um, it, uh, you know, the, the composites or the asters, the, the sunflowers, it's in that family. It's a shrub, but it, it's the pollination on these plants is just really, really good. To me, the Garberia is one of the best plants that we can have when we're looking at restoring scrubs and, and sand hills because it's such a great pollinator plant and it can become quite abundant if you manage for it well. Uh, this is a restoration at Little Big Econ. And you can see all these flower heads here and the place is just loaded with pollinators. I mean, it's a, you know, it's a incredible important habitat for, for the pollinating plants. I mean, the pollinating animals, the arthropods. And uh, this was a, this was a clear cut of sand pine and they're restoring it back to a, a long leaf pine and, um, a scrubby flatwoods habitat, which it is. Um, so when they did this, all the garbaria popped up. The seeds have been dormant in the in the seed bank and germinated. So you can see what kind of good benefits you can get from this. Now, one area that we had in that restoration area had even grown up further and was cr clouding out some of the garbaria. So this is what a fuel buster looks like. See, this shadow kind of kind of messes up the whole thing because but you can see how it opens up the habitat when you, when you, and this was just like two hours of work. I had a gopher tortoise move into this the next year after they just love it. You know, it's just, a, just some, some more open habitat. And um, so you got Garbaria doing really good in here too. And there's all kinds of scrub plants that are coming up in these areas. This is the area that it is in on that snow Hill road on the east side on the southwest um corner but they're they're doing a lot of restoration along these trails in here too in that scrub habitat a lot of garbaria in there and we we're actively trying to conserve those those populations in there the foresters are um so here's an aerial of that area you can see that it's that it's open uh, it's on snow hill road that's a good one. You can park your car right in there and, and go have a look. You know, you have this trail that goes through here. That's a wonderful, wonderful trail right there. They've, they've done a lot of burning and the, the river's down there. and It's a, it's a great place to go. So now we're going to be looking at the monitoring and research of the plants. Um, and I'm, this is just going to be really quick too. Um, one, one kind of really easy efficient way to, to look at the different kind of monitoring is looking at one, two, and three. So the level one is just presence and absence. That's just going out and mapping the plants. You know, if there's a plant there, you just kind of take a point with a GPS and then count, you know, how, how many plants are in there. Um, that's kind of level one. Now, level two is more to look at the population trends over time. So you're, you, you're, you're using a delineated area like a plot or a transect, and you're usually going there every one to two years. Now, the level three is more looking at the demographic or the traits that are specific to the species, like plant survival, growth, fecundity, recruitment. That's your level three kind of work there. And it's a really nice way to kind of compartmentalize the different monitoring that's done out there. But um, we fund all of these levels for federally listed species and these at-risk species. So uh, if you ever need help with funding, doing that in the, around the here, or uh, we, we provide funding for that. So 
the last part of this presentation, what have I learned? I know it's going to be redundant. I've said it a thousand times. Small scale removal of fuels done at regular intervals, really important for these fire adapted plants. These plants are in these seepage slopes, you know, the pitcher plants, the pinkless, uh, bot torches. Really important if you can set up some kind of a volunteer group that goes and does regular intervals of that. So, so important because they're not really getting burned. This can be done in scrub and sand hill also. But to me, this is a major focus of, of, of uh, work that we're doing right now. It's, and I said this earlier too, so a lot of this is recap what we said earlier, but important to speak with land managers frequently to show interest. As I said, you know, there, these are multi-use areas and the advocates for the other uses uh, meet with the land managers quite often. I, and I definitely know that we don't, we, we uh, plant advocates meet with land managers, but not as often as like the ORV folks do or the horse people, uh, recreation type things that if you can, if you're, if you're in the area, just talk with those land managers and just show them, show them your interest and ask them uh, how they are managing their rare plants. Um, yeah. These volunteer groups have, have just been excellent. Love to find out ways to, uh, um, but we got to make up, like I said, there's a, uh, it's a compromise, you know, between zero funding and full funding it falls in between and you just have to make up whatever's not funded. But, uh, so these identification cards have really, um, turned out to be great tools. You can make a good botanist out of even a, <laughs> a bird watcher or a, forester or just in you know anybody who doesn't know anything about plants and they're and they're they're actually wonderful uh botan they're, they're, they'll hone your botanical skills really good um but if anybody wants to do those you can contact me and uh and i can share the ones that we have with you um oh yeah and then the last one i i think it would be good to take these physiographic regions and use those as a foundation, we have county uh, uh, for plants is mostly by county. I think it would be kind of going and maybe even dissect those a little bit smaller and go to physiographic and these eco region kind of a foundation. But um, but that is all I have. And thank you. And we can take questions if you guys want. All right. Well, thank you. Um, I'm just going to go ahead and temporarily mute you so there is no feedback, but I'm going to uh, ask this question from Nicole Silvatico. She writes, Pinguicola lutea is only listed at the state level, right? Are there any protections on them? I found uh, some on private land that is planned for development. Uh -huh. Yes, so um, th they're not federally listed, and they're state threatened, so they have very, very little protection. There, and plants in general really don't have a lot of protection, except when you try to sell them. They, there's there's a pretty good protection. It you can't go take plants and rare plants and sell them. That that's that's one you know kind of regulation we have that that's pretty pretty good when it comes to the landowner the landowner, especially a threatened and not endangered then uh they they basically can uh you know they they don't have to have any permits or anything to to build over them uh, here's what we do with rare plants um we try to get the florida native plant society at, ahead of the the development and try to rescue those plants and you've probably she she may have done that already uh but there's not there's just not that much protection the protection that we have is just trying to relocate those plants that's where we focus 
most um, effort. Um, but but yeah, that's a great species. That having that pinguicula, that shows that you have a nice seepage slope or wet prairie, and that there's probably other rare plants in that general area. If you were to burn it, you would have all kinds of rare plants that would come up in there, and rare and rare animals too. Um, but uh, if you can try to relocate those pinguiculas, I, I think they're really easy to relocate. And uh, that's where I that's been in your effort. Very good. I actually had a question for you, Michael. Um, you know, before this talk, we were a group of us were interested within couple firm. We have gardeners and then we have naturalists and then a few of us are gardeners as well as naturalists. But the naturalists most certainly uh, were interested in getting a micro burn license or a uh, burn license uh, from the Florida, I, I don't know if it's the, I forget the department exactly, but we were planning to get our licensure so we can help uh, you know, with prescribed burns and land managers when they need us. So in case they needed, you know, some extra hands, we would help them with that. Now, during your presentation, uh, which I thought was extremely good, so thank you so much. I mean, it was very insightful and it, you know, just clicked a lot of our brain cells here because these are things that we constantly read and discuss um so it was very nice to see it so thank you so much before i forget about your presentation but getting back to this um burn licensure would that kind of ameliorate the situation when we need to go out there on intervals and um you know burn so that the canopy stays open so that these wildflowers have a chance to um you know bloom and thrive and reproduce yeah, that's a great, that's a great thing to consider because uh, we do, we, and we have funded, you talk about doing smaller burns. Um, I'm sorry, Miami-Dade County, they have a, a really active uh, county lands protection and they were doing burn boxes, which is, you know, 10 by 10. Uh, metal barriers that just burn really small areas 10 by 10 you know and they would increase the the population of the brick brick hills um a brick it's it's a brickle bush it's down there it's a federally listed one and that you know they would burn it and they would get huge germination and increased flowering from those areas now you can get that too from doing the fuel reduction if if you can't get in and burn an area and it's a small area, you can go in with some, with like an ax or a machete or loppers or a hand saw or a chainsaw and just open up the habitat and maintain it until it gets a big burn on top of it until they burn the whole unit. Uh, there's just so many areas that are just not even going to be burned. They're, they're just some places that are just plain, not going to get burned. So you, if you want to protect those rare plant populations you have to go in and do that fuel reduction and that's just opening up the habitat now um if you want to do this small scale burns that's a great idea and uh, let me tell you here's what my dream would be is if you guys would um develop a like a rare plant conservation um managers kind of a either a nonprofit or a business and just go in and make sure that those areas are getting uh, burned. And the Florida forest service is the ones who they're, they're the organization. That's the organization that I work for that, that does the prescriptions and the authorization to burn and, and things like that. So they're, they're all in charge of that. Um, but we'll be a lot of times, uh, a land manager like the Florida Park Service or like the FWC or Water Management District, they may or may not like ha having a smaller scale burn go on, but you could you could do it. You know, you could uh, 
show examples. You, you could, uh, you know, find people who would let you do that and show how good it works to do small scale fires uh, or fuel reduction. The answer to your question is yes, yes. That, and we would actually be able to help fund that uh, through our program if it was around federally listed plants. But uh, it's a great, great idea. It's a, it's a great vision. I wish it would happen. That's my answer. I wish. Um, my next question, oh, you're getting a lot of thank yous, by the way. Um, somebody even texted me uh, making sure that I thanked you for this awesome presentation. Uh, but my question to you now is regarding FNA. Uh, so we haven't done any, we, ha we have never interacted with FNA on a chapter level. Um, but my understanding is FNA has a price tag for their services or for the information that they share, typically. Now, if we were to do the FLEO, the Florida land, I, I forgot the FLEO, the acronym, if we were to participate in that with them, would that somehow, you know, lessen the price tag load for citizen science uh, when we need to ask them for specific data while we're sharing data with them? Yes, and I, let me let me help you with that. Now, now I used to work at FNA, and I know a lot of people there. Um, in the past, I think that they had asked there. There was a time period there. You're, to answer your question directly, you're probably not going to have to pay for it. I can't speak for FNA because I don't work there anymore. But it's if you're a nonprofit and you're doing it for plant conservation, there's a really good chance you're not going to have to pay for it. I'll tell you, the people who are going to pay for it are are the uh, like the private consultants who are doing development, you know, and um, they get a really nice report from FNA. Now, if you're asking for a big kind of in-depth report, you're going to have to pay for it. But if you're, all you're asking for is like a shape file or lat longs, you know, a uh, spreadsheet with lat longs of the plant locations, I doubt that you're going to have to pay any money for that. Now I'll get in trouble saying that because I'm, <laughs> but um, the, mostly they're, they're going to be charging to the private consultants who are doing larger developments and things like that. Well, thank you. Yeah, we are, we are wanting to, you know, track some of our rare plants here in Seminole County and neighboring regions. We just want to make sure we uh, kind of understand the landscape, you know, of professionals as well as uh, or large organizations like FNA. And then we can proceed with interacting with them as as necessary. Um, I wanted to uh, lots of fan mail here, Michael. Uh, another great present. Basem has been following us for a long time. Laura from uh, Passion Flower Chapter. Uh, Nicole is actually from our chapter, and I believe E. Carrie Catherine is from uh, your neck of the woods in Tallahassee. So we have people all over the state tuning in. Um, but again, I wanted to thank you, um, folks, uh, if there's anything else, and that was a good time to comment away. Uh, but Michael, if you, uh, had any parting words, now is a good time to share them with us. All right. Well, thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. Definitely contact me if you have any questions uh, about anything or we, we also get a lot of emails when people are just looking for things and we, we have a pretty good network of people that, that we can email to get information for this or that and all, all kinds of stuff. So just stay in touch. That's all. Sounds good. Well, everyone, thank you so much. And we will see you next month for our Moss program. Uh, don't forget our plant sale is uh, this Saturday. And then once we are uh, done with that and once COVID is out of the way, we will uh, embark on land management reviews as Michael has recommended to us. So all good things come to those who wait. And uh, we're just looking forward to 
regaining some sense of normalcy after this pandemic. So take care and we will see you soon. Thanks so much.